room at 10. It's in Peterson Gym, I believe 242 and 153. Just come to 242 first, and then we'll tell you if we need 153. Uh, we were given that room because I guess it's future Aztec Day or Explore SDSU Day. Uh, I don't expect parking to be that bad, but just realize it's no open campus. So there will be more people than typically on a Saturday. Uh, that's where we're in Peterson Gym, so I believe that's PG, that's all the way by the Aztec Recreation Center, I think. Yep. Uh, luckily, we know right. Uh, so that's the exam. I have half hour before our class. Unfortunately, my schedule is booked from 12 p.m. short, sharp, all the way to about 8 p.m. Uh, what I will do, like I did last time, uh, I'm hosting the speaker from UCSD today, so I have to take him out to dinner. Have to take him out to dinner, right? <laughs> I, I'm so bummed out, but I you know, have a dinner, uh, you know, paid for by our seminar budget, which isn't much, but it's still a seminar budget. Uh, hence, we have people from UCSD give talks rather than people from across the country. Uh, but after that, I will be on campus, so what I'll probably do is I'll do a lap around the quiet study section like I did last time. Uh, just one lap. Uh, so if you have any questions and you see me, just grab me and ask me a question. Uh, but just like I did last time, real briefly, I won't, be, I won't give any lectures or anything, just to answer any confused questions. Uh, to make up for the fact that I won't be in my office from 12 to 8. Uh, so, at the end of, and the exam's going through acid house. We're going through acid house. Uh, so at the end of lecture on Wednesday, we started talking about what an acid health is, and it's various related things. And an acetal is pretty much a carbonyl with water or alcohol added into it. So we talked about how if you have a carbonyl and you throw an acid in water, you'll be in equilibrium with a hydrate or an acetal if you will. And how this happens is a carbonyl usually isn't electrophilic enough under neutral conditions for a weak nucleophile like water to add in. But under acidic conditions, we protonate the carbonyl, which activates the electrophilicity by making it a positively charged uh, carbonyl. And so now water can add as a carbonyl carbon. And then uh, to give a cis intermediate, which is H2O plus an HO. And then just another building of water, we can do an intermolecular proton transfer, picking up the proton from H2O plus, giving us our hydrate. So this is why the Jones reaction will take a primary alcohol and go all the way to the carboxylic acid. Because under acidic aqueous conditions, carbonyls will form this. And if this can oxidize, if one of the R groups is an H, it will. So that's as if, if, if you have water as your solvent, so water and acid. Uh, if you have meth an alcohol, like methanol, and water as your solvent, uh, Mechanism is very similar. You just replace the water with methanol and it goes twice. Meaning, you protonate your carbonyl, now your alcohol adds in, giving you this intermediate. Uh, you can call this a hemiacetal. So hemi is different. Hemisphere, different spheres, or different half sphere. Well, I guess hemi is semi. Well, I don't know Latin or English or Harry Potter and. Uh, <laughs> or anything like that, or the difference between those languages, to be honest. Uh, but we form what we call a hemiacetal, where the two things are different, O-M-E, O-H, or O-M-E, N-R, anything where the two things in the carbonyl are different substituents. All right, and so then we have this, in equilibrium, we have a proton, a intramolecular proton transfer, where the hydrogen goes from the M-E-O-H plus the, the OH neutral, and this is completely in equilibrium, right? Because the pKa difference between this and this is negligible. So this is a complete equilibrium reaction. So there's going to be nothing really pushing it forward to either direction. It's going to be a one-to-one, one-to-one -one ratio. However, if we form this intermediate, then the MeO can uh, have its own pair of electrons kick in and kick up H2O as a leaving group, giving us this weird carbonyl methyl plus. However, if, if, if the proton is here, then these electrons can go kick out the MeOH to give us the reverse reaction. 
So this reaction is the definition of reversibility. And the way you control this reaction is with our good friend, the Chatelier serum. And I'll get into that in a second, once they finish the mechanism. But going towards the productive pathway, so keep going forward, we kick this off, kick water off to give us our OME carbonyl looking thing. And then another film that methanol can add in, because this is a carbonyl with a positive charge in the oxygen, so we know it's a very electrophilic carbonyling type thing. Uh, that's my new oxygen, carbonyling. And so the methanol is going to add in, and it's going to give us now this acetal words MEOH and MEO. And then the methanol is going to take the proton, do an intramolecular proton transfer, giving us our uh, carbonyl with two equivalents of methanol added into it. So we, so pretty much we have an equilibrium in methanol and acid between the carbonyl and the alcohol added into it. So you can take the carbonyl and go to the acetal, or you can take the acetal and go to the carbonyl. The key is your reaction conditions, yes? So over there in the second to last step, right here? is that, yeah, is that an OME? Yes, it is. And oxygen with a... That's an oxygen with a methyl and a proton. Okay. So it's methanol adding to the carbonyl okay. before the proton is picked up. So under a set conditions in methanol, we have an equilibrium. The way we control this equilibrium is by Le Chatelier's theorem. And what I mean is, if you have more methanol in your reaction, so if you use methanol as a solvent, you're going to favor the acetal. However, if you take the acetal, that was kind of <coughs> unexpected. So if you take the acetal, and you add acidic water, that will give you the hydrate, and then you dry it, and then you remove water by drying it. So, you know, removing everything by vacuum, for instance. That will give us the carbonyl. So this reaction is highly reversible, and you control it by your reaction conditions. If you want the alcohol added into it twice, you, add more, you keep adding more alcohol into your system until the equilibrium favors this. And if you want the carbonyl, then you just add more water and then you to get the hydrate and then you remove it. Yes? Oh, so like you have those intermediates where you have a ketone and then you have a methyl yeah. or like oxide added to it? Yeah. Um, does, that, does that only apply for acetals or can that? Uh, this applies for all carbonyl chemistry under say conditions that the valves added. Oh, okay. Yeah. If you use the uh, no, uh, with acids, I was going to go both ways. So you only have, like, alcohol? So if you have more alcohol, it's going to, by Le Chatelier's theorem, this equilibrium is going to shift uh, to favor the product as you keep adding alcohol into the system. If you remove the alcohol and add water instead, then it's going to favor the hydrate. And then if you... So if you take your... And I'll show this mechanism in a second. So if you take this and add H2O and water, this will convert to the hydrate again. And then if we remove the water from the system, and there are several ways to remove water from a system. Let's add an organic solvent like DCM, for instance. Uh, with, and then maybe a drying agent like sodium sulfite. So something that's going to be pulling water out of the system, then the equilibrium is going to favor the carbonyl over the hydrate. So under dry conditions, the equilibrium favors the carbonyl over the hydrate. And that's why PCC steps once, because there's no water around, because it's, uh, it's done under an hydrate condition. So since there's no water, the equilibrium is going to favor the, uh, the carbonyl. So the key thing to realize is this acetal chemistry is incredibly reversible, and you control it by your reaction conditions. 
So if you take a carbonyl and you dissolve it in methanol and acid, you're going to get the acetal with, with water added. Yeah, so uh, this is what we get. If we change our conditions or we take the acetal and add in water H3O and then dry it, we'll get the carbonyl. And so the mechanism of going from here to here is pretty much the exact reverse of going from the carbonyl to the acetal. So the first step is you protonate one of the OMEs. Then you can kick out methanol. Give us this carbonyly methylated intermediate. And so now, since this is in water, water can add in. to give us our hemi-acetal again. And we do an intermolecular proton transfer. So I'm just doing this, the first mechanism in blue, but I'm doing it backwards. And that's how we go from acetal back to the carbonyl. The theory of macroscopic reversibility at play. Now we have the hydrogen from the after this proton transfer and the MeOH plus. So now we can kick out methanol. Alright. And now we have two choices. We have water, we can go and pick out this proton the problem with carbonyl. But obviously, we're going to be under aqueous conditions, right? Uh, so it will be in equilibrium. And so what will probably most likely happen is water will actually add as a nucleophile to give us our hydrate. Positive charge and then we pick out this proton. To get the hydrate. But, when we're going back to the carbonyl, under the reaction conditions and our acidic conditions, we'll get the hydrate. But then we usually do something. And what we do is we take the mixture and we add an organic solvent and we extract the product into the organic solvent. And by removing the product from the DCM, we're, 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 oh, and removing the product from the water, we are removing water from the system, right? The product's no longer in aqueous conditions, it's inorganic. And so then what will happen is, maybe I'll do it in blue. What will happen when we remove this element from the system is we'll get back to the carbonyl intermediate and then eventually it will get deprotonated to give us the carbonyl. So we have the carbonyl under acidic conditions, acidic aqueous conditions, you're gonna have the hydrate. But if you work it up and dry it, then what we'll see, what we'll actually isolate, will be the carbonyl. So carbonyls and hydrates, or carbonyls and acetals, are always in equilibrium. It's just if you're in dry conditions, you'll have the carbonyl. If you're under aqueous conditions, wet with that water conditions, you'll have the hydrate. If you're in alcohol, you'll have the uh, acidic alcohol conditions, you'll have the, the acetal like this. So it is an equilibrium process and it's completely favored by our reaction conditions. I'll go with Shepley A's theorem. Professor, I don't understand that last step. I don't see what happened. Which step? The last step, all the way bottom left, that blue. 
Yeah, oh, so I had explained, I didn't write down, I explained, blue is when we're removing the system from water. So when we're removing water, so the Chatelier's theorem is always going to favor this, well, the Chatelier's theorem says a chemical reaction is always in equilibrium. So under water conditions, we will have a hydrate. And so in blue, that's my bad, I, I had explained it, I hadn't actually written it down. Uh, when we remove the system from water, uh, the equilibrium between uh, the carbon, so this equilibrium here, between the hydrate, so this blue was this equilibrium. So when we remove water from the system, uh, when we remove water from the system, this, these little pair of electrons, as I drew here, are going to eventually kick off water. The reason being is it has to, it has to reach equilibrium again, and the only way it can reach equilibrium is by losing water, right? If you take out uh, starting materials or products, the equilibrium is going to shift accordingly. So when we remove water, the equilibrium is going to shift towards the carbonyl because it needs to generate the water to try and reach equilibrium. The way it generates the water is by having the hydrate kick off water. Does that answer your question? I just don't see your mechanism. I don't understand. Like, I, I know what you said, but it looks to me like you're making another double bond and I went right to it. Oh, I'm missing an error. Okay. Maybe. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. So when we're going back to a carbonyl from a alcoholic being acidic, so we can solve it, right? So, like, so we water. Yeah. But, so we can't follow this one. Say it one more time. <laughs> No, if we go back to carbonyl, you would just go with uh, aqueous. You throw in some water. So if we excuse method, yeah, because again, it's equilibrium. And if methanol is your solvent, then everything's going to be shifted. So if, in this case, with carbonyl, if you're if you do it in methanol, methanol is one of the reacting partners. And so by the Shelby Ice theorem, we'll be adding one of the starting materials into the system. And so that's going to really cause the equilibrium to shift. Uh, towards the product because there's so much more starting material than products if we're using it as a solvent. So, our still chemistry is the Chatelier's theorem at work. Yes? At the blue area, you said you're going back to the Yeah, so what I'm saying is under under aqueous conditions, which we did an electro pushing, you're not going to get the carbonyl out, you're going to get the hydrate. Because under acidic aqueous conditions, the equilibrium is going to favor the, the hydrate over the carbonyl. But we isolate the carbonyl, and the way we isolate the carbonyl is we work the reaction up by removing water. And so as we remove water, the equilibrium is going to shift from the hydrate to the carbonyl. Because there's no more water, so it's going to keep kicking off water and try to reach equilibrium, but it won't be able to reach equilibrium because we keep removing the water. And by the time we remove all the water, then the hydrate is going to be unhydrated, if you will, and be the carbonyl. Yes? Jones. Well, you do, right? I, under, with the Jones. Wait, wait, sorry. With the non aqueous or the aqueous? The aqueous one. Yeah. Well, yeah, but the oxidize is the second alcohol. <coughs> so, yeah, with Jones, you form this diol, and then it oxidizes the diol with the carboxylic acid. So, uh, this is carbonyl chemistry we can't escape. So, let me give you some examples. So, a common one. Is, under acidic conditions, to take your I take a diol, to take a diol, so ethylene glycol in this case, as your alcohol, acidic conditions, and RO minus. And so I'm not going to, this mechanism is going to be identical to what we've gone over. So we're going to protonate this, and this is going to add it. And I'm going to skip a couple steps, because we've gone over this mechanism several times. But eventually, what we will get as an intermediate doing all this chemistry is we will get this, you know, this is like a carbonyl-y, positively uh, charged stuff. 
And so from this mechanism, uh, we have a choice of another equivalent of alcohol adding in, or we have the alcohol that's tethered to it adding in. <coughs> and in this case, the tethered alcohol or the intramolecular reaction will always occur over the intramolecular. So we will not get this. At least we will not isolate this. What we will isolate will be the product of this, of the tethered alcohol adding in. All right. So when you have a tethered alcohol, then you need the intramolecular cyclization. So this is the product that you'll end up isolating out. And the reason being is even if you do form this, this can always go back here. And the question is, what's more thermodynamically stable? Uh, this guy or this guy? And since this guy's a five-membered ring, and it's uh, entropically favored, because it only, because entropy didn't go down as much with this, this, this one takes two equivalents of alcohol, so that takes two freely moving alcohols and puts them in the same product. This only takes one, so this would be entropically favored. Yes? Um, Does water take away the H? Yes. Water or, uh, or the alcohol. Uh, but, you know, I, I, again, I didn't try the mechanism, but yes, you could have one of these taking away the H, you could have the water formed from protonation taking away the H, but something something that's a decent base has to take the base away. Yes? Yes? So, um, in that first step, when we're adding the, uh, the group of the two oxygen, yeah. where does the other oxygen go? What do you mean? Because uh, we're adding it to the carbonyl, right? Oh, yeah, well, that, that's just a typical acetal mechanism. Okay. So, this gets protonated. This adds in, okay. right? And so this is the same mechanism that we had just got over, uh, just with a different alcohol. So we get this, and then we do a proton transfer. We get H2O plus. And then we pick up H2O plus to get this. Okay, uh, yeah. Sorry, I mentioned I wasn't going to make this, but maybe the more examples, the better. So why not? OK? So the take-home message from this is if you have a diol, you're going to get the cyclic acetal. So what do you think is going to be more stable, an acyclic acetal or a cyclic acetal? The cyclic acetal. Because if you add acid and water, and we go back here to this intermediate, it's going to be perhaps easier for this to attack to give us a product back than for another equivalent like water to attack to give us our starting material. So these are more stable. That being said, they're more stable, but if you add HBO in water, and then you work it up and remove water, and the will dry, you'll still get the carbonyl out. So it still behaves like an acetal.